So the title of my topic is Current Trends in Embryology, the Role of Time-Lapse Embryo Monitoring. During the past 40 years or more since the advent of IVF or in the past 60 years, when we look back and identify what are the major changes that affected our career and our way of doing things is the first is the IVF in 1978. In late 90s, the advent of ICSI and testicular sperm extraction has really changed the way we practice reproductive medicine. In the early 2000s, when everybody was struggling with the excess embryos, then came the phenomenal uh, technology, which has simplified the way we try to preserve the genetic material, the vitrification. These three made the way we practice radically different. But there are still two more things. One is which are evolving and only time will tell us whether they have made significant impact the way we practice. One is the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Initially, it was the FISH method. Later, it was the CGH. Now, it is a next generation sequencing. And the material is the day eight cell embryo biopsy, the blastomere biopsy. Now, we are moving in, into the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in two areas. Identifying spent culture media and doing a pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And also a new trend that is evolving is the polygenic scoring of the embryo, where two or three clinics in the world are also offering it, otherwise known as the designer baby. And then the role of time-lapse monitoring. Only time will tell us whether time-lapse time monitoring is a change which is come to stay here or it's a fad like many things we have seen before. I've, we have been using time-lapse for the last two years and I would like to share some of the insights we got during this procedure. The time-lapse monitoring on the right side, you see a screen where it contains 16 wells. That means you can use for one patient up to 16 oocytes. And then it's a, a designed uh, dish. And one dish, one should remember is one dish is not compatible with another group of companies. So whenever you buy a time-lapse machine, make sure when you expand, you, share, you have to end up buying the same machine. That is one of the key features one should remember because the culture dish that is there is not interchangeable. So here at the bottom on the right side, you have these wells where you can do the selection. This A1, A2 are the algorithms that the company provides or you can use a manu manual algorithm. And as the embryo goes in, you get these uh, markings if it is an artificial intelligence based thing. I'll show you how a time-lapse image of a completed embryo looks like. Here you're seeing the appearance of the pronucleate, the disappearance, the two cell division, the four cell division, the eight cell, the compacted em embryo, and then the expanded blastocyst. Here, except for the dramatics of the movie play, one might think what is great in time lapse. But time lapse is completely changing the way we understand embryology. One might think time lapse is a relatively recent technique. The first documented scientific evidence for time lapse imaging of the embryo on the rabbits happened in almost 94 years back. That is, in 1929, in the Science magazine, in the volume. 69. So this technology is not a new technology. Only with the advent of better cameras, better memory, better graphics, we're able to reinvent the time lapse and trying to use it into our day-to-day -day career. When we look at the evolution of the human embryo monitoring, we can divide them into four things. Single point monitoring, continuous embryo monitoring, manual algorithms, and artificial intelligence. For many years, all of us are using a single point assessment where we do it either at 18 hours or 24 hours for the for the fertilization check, then the, the cleavage, then depending on the type of transfer policy we, we have, we are checking on the second day or third day or fourth day or fifth day. Whereas in a continuous monitoring, the machine monitors it and only have to interpret the data. And in the manual algorithms, it gives you a space to write those observations and then select the embryo. And in artificial intelligence, 
it picks up the abnormality, tells the abnormality, and marks the abnormality and says and selects these are the embryos that you need to transfer. In other words, what happens is we are moving from an embryologist who is right till now a technical person should move into a knowledge worker. If they become knowledge workers, then they feel fascinated with this field. If they feel that just fertilizing the embryo and putting back into the incubator and then transferring, that's all is embryology, then they're in for a root shock in the coming years. All embryologists should become knowledge workers, then only they'll be able to use this technology in a better way. We have moved in the last 40 to 50 years in the incubator systems. And in this incubator system, where you see, this is the incubator in which Louis Brown was cultured and grown from a, a flask-based incubator to a, a highly sensed to monitored system. We have come a long way in the incubator systems. When we look at conventional incubators, be it the box type incubator, the mink incubator, or the time-lapse incubator, one should remember one thing. They will never ever increase the pregnancy rate. They'll make us make less mistakes. And the mistakes that are happening in the laboratory in terms of culture conditions are minimized in the uninterpreted culture. And the information you get is vast so that to select or deselect an embryo, the technology is using. One can always do an IVF in the box incubator, the mink incubator, and the time lapse. It does not mean that one should absolutely have a time lapse incubator to do IVF. But as you go, as you move ahead and hear the lecture, you will see that it will make you make less mistakes. This time lapse incubator contains six chambers where there is an inbuilt temperature control sensor for each of these uh, in, uh, well, men, uh, culture holes. And each incubator or each well or plate, whatever you say, has one camera where it takes photographs in 11 planes in every five minutes and then stitches them with the software into a film. And then the fourth thing is optimal culture conditions. The fifth is the wavelength of light this is used is as much longer wavelength, so the embryo light-based uh, uh, injury is avoided. And last but not the least is the humidification is a factor in these incubators. So unlike a mink incubator where you can put any dish you, you want, in, in this in incubator, what, what happens is uh, you are constrained to keep only the particular incubator. This is how a uh, jerry looks like and uh, it will take care of uh, six patients at any given point. And uh, we opted for two systems because we moved into a total time-lapse incubation system. And uh, I'm sure right now I'm showing you how the, uh, the dish looks like. This dish is uh, different for different time-lapse machines. You can't interchange one dish to the other, another thing. And in this, you keep up to 16 oocytes. And then once you shut it, you can only remove it on the day when you want to transfer the embryos. Rest of the things, you can look at the monitor and you can also look in, in your clinic by virtualization software that comes in. With these things, say, I would say the age of precision embryology has come in. And now I'll explain why the precision embryology. When we look at factors that affect the cleavage of an embryo, age makes a difference, etiology makes a difference, stimulation protocol, the ICSI person who is doing it, the media, the handling, the oocyte maturity, the oxygen, the temperature, the pH, the biopsy, all affect the viability of the embryo. And time-lapse incubation will reduce some of these things. One is it reduces the uninterrupted culture conditions, so media variability, there's no handling, so there is this factor is eliminated. The oxygen saturation, the temperature, and the pH and the humidity gives so alarms for every feature so that some of the factors in the culture conditions are improved in a time-lapse incubation system. Now let's look at what do we do in a conventional laboratory. Suppose on a Monday morning, we do a pickup at 8 o'clock. Then on Tuesday, we do a fertilization check. And on the Tuesday evening, we do the cleavage check. On Wednesday, that is the day second, depending on the protocol, we might check it, might not check it. And on Thursday, the day three, we check for the embryo before transfer. And if we are doing a blastocyst, then we check it on the day five. And these have 
been useful for the time, but not all these pick up aneuploidy embryos. And I'll show you in the next couple of slides why. The fertilization, there's a change in the fertilization check time. After the advent of uh, time-lapse incubation, they realized if somebody is checking uh, a fertilization check at 16, uh, beyond 16 to 18 hours, they might, they might 8 to 10 percent of the PN, and then they say they did not fertilize. So there is a need for change in the fertilization check. The second thing is we miss abnormal cleavage divisions, that is the direct cleavage, the reverse cleavage, which are again are suggestive of aneuploidy or abnormal genetic material embryo. And we also know a delayed embryo, even though it's a blastocyst, does not have a same equal implantation potential. So the learnings that have come from time lapse, which can be integrated into the normal thing is a change in fertilization check time. In a beautiful article, Renzi has published a paper in 2017. They suggested the title name, Focus Time Lapse Analysis Reveals Novel Aspects of Human Fertilization and Suggested New Parameters of Embryo Viability. And these are going to change the way we practice embryology. And at our clinic, these are being very helpful. What are those parameters? The parameters which we find and integrate into our practice are the second polar body emission, the cytoplasmic wave, the appearance of female pronucleus, then the male pronucleus, the general position of the pronucleus, then the alignment, the cytoplasmic halo, the disappearance of the cytoplasmic halo, the PN breakdown, and the cleavage. If you find that there is no cytoplasmic halo, again, the blastocyst formation is low. If you find the appearance of male pronucleate is in the beginning compared to the female pronucleus, again, it's an abnormality. So these 13 events in the first 30, 30 hours are making a huge difference in deselecting an abnormal embryo so that the embryo which does, which has perfect events of these have a higher implantation potential. And when we look at these 13 events, we should also uh, learn to understand this morphopokinetic technology, what is TPB1 is time to second polar body exclusion. The second is time to appearance of the pronuclease, then time to pronuclease fading, and then the two cell lesion. Most of the time, your two cell lesion should happen before 30 hours to have a good quality embryo for implantation. And the gap between your fading of the two pronuclease fading to the two cell division should be short but not be very long. All these events are becoming predictors for blastocyst and in fact implantation thing. These are the various nomenclature just for the sake of information I have kept in which we will be using, all of us will be using with time. Here at Krishna IVF what we do is for all embryos we plot a graph wherein we plot in within the minimum and the maximum and the embryo that falls within this plane uh, of PN appearance, PN disappearance, 2 cell, 3 cell, 4 cell, 5 cell, 16 cell morilla, and plot this graph, whichever embryo that falls within this thing, those are the embryos we transfer, which in turn helps us to improve the pregnancy rate. I would say that time lapse will help you to deselect an embryo rather than select an embryo. If your embryo is outside this range, uh, have an embryo within this range, then I would prefer to transfer this embryo. I'll be letting you know in a few minutes why. There's a beautiful article in 2021 where optimization of timing of fertilization assessment, which I discussed earlier, if you do not change your fertilization assessment to 16 hours, you might miss 8.6 percentage of all ICSI derived zygotes. You will say they are unfertilized and 10 percent of IVFs, uh, IVF zygotes are unfertilized. So the learning from time lapse is the fertilization check should move to 16 and a half hours so that you're able to pick up all the fertilized thing. Otherwise, if you don't see a PN, you, you might think it's an un unfertilized and discard the embryo. By adopting this procedure, you might save and avoid discarding a healthy embryo because timing has changed with the advent of time-lapse embryo. Now let's consider some of the abnormal embryos, which we might think are normal embryos and transferred in a typical lab, which I'll be directly telling about a direct cleavage, a reverse cleavage, and a mosaic pattern. Here in a direct cleavage, 
here what happens is in a direct cleavage here this, this is the di diagram of the of the video which i'm going to show you here uh, what happened is there is an abnormal cell cleavage here and then you find an abnormal cell in the blastocyst this can be one of the reason for having a mosaic embryo in your uh, pgd cycle let's see the video here you're seeing the two pair uh, two pronucleus then at six o'clock you are seeing a, a extra direct cleavage and cleavage uh, blastocysts which luckily did not divide any further but got segregated it divided into two cell and then remained as such here when we see we might think this is a six cell embryo but in true sense it's a four cell embryo with two abnormal blastocysts coming from a direct cleavage and the same blastomer again has fused together at six o'clock position. This is the six o'clock position. And as you see, this blastomer blaster has been left and it's forming a good uh, blastocyst. Here in this situation, what, what we feel is we may think that this, uh, this embryo, this blastocyst is excellent blastocyst and then think uh, why didn't the patient give a uh, didn't did not give an implantation and then start thinking that we transferred a good blastocyst but still a pregnancy did not come and then we start looking elsewhere here we have missed a cleavage stage division so there are the second type of cleavage is the reverse cleavage which i'll be showing you here what happens is here this is the 46 chromosomes here at the second cleavage is a 46 then these two fused and became 92 and then started div dividing it this this will give a very very low implantation and high abortion rate let's see how it is here you see the 2p 2pn alignment the the cytoplasmic uh, then you're seeing the cell, cell, cell division into two cells which has happened at the right time then into four cells then as you watch this 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 blastomere then you'll see the fusion happening here here you see the fusioning happening so now you have two two blastomere with 96 92 chromosomes and rest with 46 chromosomes and this will look like on the third day as a reasonably satisfactory embryo and we say we transferred a good embryo so reverse cleavage is one event which we keep on missing it and then only time lapse can pick up these events and it is not uh, rare uh, we see close to five to six percent of all the uh, embryos having a direct or reverse cleavage embryos we were missing a huge lot of information now here i'm showing you a, a triploidy how it forms uh, here you see the two polar bodies if the one polar body is not you see if you see only one polar body then the cause for the triploid is from the female if you see two polar bodies then the cause can be from the male let's see how it looks like here you're seeing both the polar, polar bodies seen Then, as you watch, Pembro, this is the third pronuclear that has come in. And if you don't observe with time lapse, you might miss the two, two, 3 pn. Then you look at saying a, two, a good two cell embryo. Uh, and then we look at four cell and then transfer this embryo, saying things are good. So, here uh, in a triploidy, you're, you're missing this information unless you're looking at time lapse monitoring you will not be able to pick it up some of the some of the pgd results when one gets one sees that when they see triploid in a blastocyst this is the mechanism how it forms and it can be picked up to a large extent by time lapse here you're seeing a reasonably good compacted embryo but as we allowed it to progress, it is degenerating 
But if we transfer it at the at the at the three at the four cell or at the um, here it's forming a blastocyst. So you end up transferring an embryo which you feel is perfect, but it's actually a triploid embryo, and it looks as a perfectly good embryo. So these are the events, and in 2021, the Spanish group have went further and, I, and did pre-implantation genetic diagnosis in embryos with morphokinetic signature, and they come up with interesting data. The, the green line is the euploid embryo, the light blue is the mosaic embryo, dark blue is also mosaic embryo, and uh, the gray is the aneuploid embryo. And these are on the y-axis, you see the number of hours, x-axis, you're seeing the, the when, uh, blastomere, uh, blastocyst. Here, the green embryo's timeline is different from the gray and the blue. With time and with better information, we'll be able to find out or at least exclude uh, or select possible euploid embryos by time-lapse embryo and then doing a PGD in those so that you don't have to send an awful lot of embryos for PGD. Maybe if you have a good time-lapse imaging embryo, then you can send only one embryo for genetic testing or at the most two embryos for genetic testing. That in turn saves the costing for the patient. This is the, the so a combination of time-lapse selected pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is, is the way forward. And similarly, the, the spent culture media or the blastocyst fluid aspirated uh, PGD is the evolution that is coming in in the area of uh, integrating time-lapse with uh, the PGD. So finally, the benefits of time-lapse incubation system is one is better culture systems, and it's giving us more information, which the scientific community is trying to unravel. And one thing is technology makes us make less mistakes and makes us deselect abnormal embryos. That is what I wanted to say as a carry home message. Finally, it brings embryology into the clinic and demystifies the embryology of what we just call up the embryology lab and say, how is the embryos? They say, good. But that time is gone because you have access in your own clinic to log into the chamber and look at the embryos and, and analyze and also show the patient why their embryo did not implant. I thank one and all for the patient hearing.